السلام علیکم مائی نیم از ساہر ان اوور گروپ از گروپ نمبر ٹو می اینڈ مائی گروپ ممبرز آر گوئنگ ٹو پرزینٹ اوور پروجیکٹ آف ایتھکس اینڈ سوشل ریسپانسبلٹی سو دا گروپ ممبرس فرام اوور گروپ آر ساہر صالحہ ربیہ شامین مصبہ شبیر عشا ملک حلیمہ سادیہ ابیہ خان کشف سیماب مریم طارق اینڈ لدملہ For this project, we were asked to choose an ethical dilemma and present over its two different courses of action. So what is an ethical dilemma? Dilemma means a problem where a choice or decision has to be made. To have you more than one choices might put you in dilemma. Ethical dilemma is a situation in which a difficult choice has to be made between two courses of action or two moral imperatives. neither of which is unambiguously acceptable or preferable euthanasia euthanasia also known as mercy killing euthanasia is an act or practice of painlessly putting to death a person suffering from painful incurable disease or incapacitating physical disorder Euthanasia allows them to die by withholding treatment or to withdraw artificial life support measures. It is frequently asked, does an individual who has no hope of recovery have the right to decide how and when to end his or her life? My group members will now talk about why euthanasia should be allowed or why euthanasia should be forbidden. What is the legal position of euthanasia? What does the religious or the cultural ethic has to say about euthanasia? Then in the perspective of different ethical theories, what is the standing of euthanasia? And then we will conclude our presentation. Assalamu alaikum this is Ms. Shabir I'm going to discuss about the different types of euthanasia Euthanasia comes in several different forms each of which brings a different set of rights and wrongs It is divided into five types first one is voluntary second one is non voluntary third is involuntary fourth is active and fifth is passive euthanasia So let's start with the voluntary euthanasia Voluntary euthanasia occurs at the request of the person who dies. It is committed with the willing or autonomous cooperation of the subject. This means that the subject is free from direct or indirect pressure from others. This include cases of asking for help with dying, refusing burdensome medical treatment, asking for medical treatment to be stopped or life support machines to be switched off, refusing to eat and simply deciding to die. Now we will discuss about the involuntary euthanasia. Involuntary euthanasia occurs when the person who dies chooses life and is killed anyway. This is usually called murder, but it is possible to imagine cases where the killing would count as being for the benefit of the person who dies. Consider the following example. A soldier has their stomach blown open by a shell burst. They are in a great pain and screaming in agony. They beg the army doctor to save their life. The doctor knows that they will die in 10 minutes whatever happens. As he has no pain killing drug with him, he decides to spare the soldier for their pain and shoots them dead. Here comes the non-voluntary euthanasia. Non-voluntary euthanasia occurs when the person is unconscious or otherwise unable, for example a very young baby or a person of extremely low intelligence, to make a meaningful choice between living and dying, and an appropriate person takes the decision on their behalf. Non-voluntary euthanasia also includes cases where the person is a child who is mentally and emotionally able to take the decision but is not regarded in law as old enough to take such a decision, so someone else must take it on their behalf in the eyes of the law. This includes cases the person is in a coma, 
The person is too young, for example, a very young baby. The person is senile. The person is mentally retarded to a very severe extent. The person is severely brain damaged. The person is mentally disturbed in such a way that they should be protected from themselves. Now I will let you know about active euthanasia. In active euthanasia, a person directly and deliberately causes patient's death. Active euthanasia is when death is brought by an act. For example, when a person is killed by being given an overdose of painkillers. Here comes its last type that is passive euthanasia. Passive euthanasia is when death is brought about by an omission. For example, when someone lets a person die. This can be withdrawing treatment. For example, switching off a machine that is keeping a person alive so that they can die of their disease. Or withholding treatment. For example, not carrying out surgery that will extend life for a short time. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Ludmila. Option 1. Every person needs to have right to decide in order to end his life in case of a terminal illness. Argument in favor. Additional cost of medicines. By keeping a terminally ill person alive with the help of expensive medications and medical equipment, the money spent on it are wasted. That money and resources can be used to treat people who don't have very ha bad prognosis and can be directed on research for new meds and cures for terminal diseases. That in future these diseases will no more be terminal. Life extension of terminally ill person. Modern medicines has become so advanced at keeping the terminally ill alive by treating the complications of underlying diseases that inevitable process of dying has become much harder and is often prolonged unnecessarily. Without any artificial life support of dying person who suffers from pain or great discomfort, his torment can be ended prematurely. If there is no cure, no any hope left, then what for to prolong life of a patient? And all these procedures come at a cost too. Billions of dollars are spent to prolong life of such patients. It is humane to allow a person to decide for his life. Most important is to take into consideration through what terminally ill person or his loved ones are going. Not everyone have strong nature to endure pain and sufferings which most such patients have. Healthy and happy person will never ask to die prematurely. It means that person who asks for euthanasia have enough strong arguments for such serious decision. It is humane to weight all arguments and make decision in favor of terminally ill person. Grant him his wish to end his misery and torment and let him live this life with a dignity. Getting rid of the moral torment. We need to take in consideration psychological aspect of waiting for inevitable and painful death too. For example, people who suffer from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis fated to observe slow degradation of their body. This disease do not affect the brain function. Till last moment, these people understand everything what happens to them. They mostly die from suffocation when muscles of their lungs are not able to work any longer. These people have full right to decide to do they want to go through these sufferings or end it prematurely. I am Isha Malik. Every person needs to have a right to decide whether to end his or her life prematurely in the case of terminal illness. I am going to give the arguments against option 1. Point 1 is, life is priceless in any of its manifestation, even if a person experiences pain and torment, it is one of the stages of being. Everything in this world has its own purpose, nothing is useless even to an ant 
Life is important. The most precious asset of a person is his life. No one has right to decide someone else's life. Taking someone else's life in such a way is equals to murder. Life is priceless. No one can return one's life if a person is in a pain. You want to live a healthy life and always hopeful. No one has right to decide the fate of someone else's life. It's a person's own choice to live or not. Point 2. The resolution of euthanasia can slow down the development of diagnosis and the treatment of serious diseases. Even if the progress is slow, euthanasia is not a solution. No matter slow or fast, progress is progress. Even if a person is slowly recovering, there is much to discover about their disease. It's possible that complete discovery of disease may help finding the cure of the disease treatment. So euthanasia is not a solution for such problem, but hope and recovery is. Point 3. There are also amazing cases in history when people are somehow inexplicably cured of deadly diseases. If a person is allowed to leave life earlier, then maybe this will take away his chance to survive. Never stop believing, miracles happen every day. Sometimes people are saved from huge accidents, unaffected. Some are almost dying, but are miraculously saved and get a new life again. Some are on ventilator for months and for years, but there, and there is no chance of recovery, but they survive because of miracles. Miracle happen to, miracle can happen to anyone we should not lose hope hopelessness is a serious problem in this regard i am abiha khan and i am going to explain the last two against argument of option one according to the ethical theories ethical theories are the rule and the principle that determine right and wrong for any given situation Egoism supports my argument. Adam Smith was a major contributor to this theory. The focus of this theory is individual desires and interests. It is a theory about our deepest motivation which are private. The point is not to deprive people of their last day of spirituality. It is mean that everyone has a chance to grow spiritually standing on the edge of that and it is wrong to take away him from his opportunity. So no one has a right to end someone's life for personal benefit. Whether you think egoism is a right or wrong depends a lot what kind of egoism you are talking about. The two main kinds of egoism are quite different. Descriptive egoism just claim that human beings do always act for their benefit, while normative egoism claim that we should always act for our benefit. In above situation, one is choosing normative egoism, also termed ethical egoism, which claim people should act in self-serving way because it is morally right. In the second point, active euthanasia, which means when the patient inject himself and medication and commit suicide, it's come under the heading of descriptive egoism, which go that the people always act in a self-serving way. Through they may try to fulfill their motives. It is not allowed in any case, but one should involve the doctor in this action. Almost everyone will act against their short term and self interest in order to obtain a great long term self interest. As a final note, it should be a mentioned that a psychological egoism can't be saved by a psychological theory, which means that the unconscious rises, the possibility that we have unconscious desires and can act against our conscious learning. I am Maryam Tariq and I am here to discuss about option 2 which is uh, legalizing euthanasia can lead to its criminal use against elderly and sick people to get right of caring for them and uh, take possession of their property. Many people worry that if voluntary euthanasia were to become legal, 
It would not be long before involuntary euthanasia would start to happen. This is called a slippery slope argument. In general, it says that uh, if we allow something relatively harmless today, we may start a trend that results in something currently unthinkable becoming accepted. Medical decision makers already face difficult moral dilemmas in choosing between competing demands for their limited funds. So making euthanasia legal could increase the severity of slippery slope pushing people towards euthanasia who may not otherwise choose it. My point is in favor of this statement that uh, abuse against vulnerable individuals. Legalization of euthanasia may lead to its abuse against weak individuals such as old people, infants whose uh, faith is decided by their relatives. The fear here is that if it is allowed, vulnerable people will be put under pressure to end their lives. It would be difficult and uh, impossible to stop people using persuasions to get people to request euthanasia when they do not really want it. My point is in favor of this statement that uh, abuse against vulnerable individuals. Legalization of euthanasia may lead to its abuse against weak individuals such as old people, infants, whose uh, faith is decided by their relatives. The fear here is that if it is allowed, vulnerable people will be put under pressure to end their lives. It would be difficult and uh, impossible to stop people using persuasions to get people to request euthanasia when they do not really want it. And second point is also in favor of this statement, which is psychological pressure on weak. Relatives and interested persons can exert psychological pressure on weak people and force them to use euthanasia. For example, there are many AIDS patients who have been totally abandoned by their families. In this state of isolation, cut off every source of life and affection, they would see death as the only liberation open to them. In this situation, even very subtle pressure could bring people to request immediate painless death when they want is close and powerful support and love. Think about others suffering as well. A person should think not only about himself, but also about those people who are forced to take care of him and they experience moral and material discomfort. Euthanasia is usually viewed from the point view of the person who wants to die, but it affects other people too and uh, their rights should be considered. Also, the last few months of a patient's life are often most expensive in terms of medical care. Shortening this period through euthanasia could be seen as a way of relieving pressure on family finances. The world of insurance involves complex and thorny ethical decisions as professionals in the field non-insurance ethics. A first way of developing the field of insurance ethics is to look at the challenges, challenges facing cure professionals involved in insurance such as lawyer and market.
Major cases of death in mothers and children could be prevented or treated with access to simple and affordable medicines. However, many medicines are not available in cases physical therapy and exercise etc. It's me Ms. Shabir and the argument that I'm going to talk about is how to determine whether a person healthy or sick brings benefit to the society or not and by which criteria it can be done. So in the explanation of this I would like to say a sick person who seems useless to the society it is not even useless just because of this that he or she is abnormal but he or she is still contributing his positive role to our society. History told us there were many sick and abnormal people. Whenever a person who is slowly and gradually going towards the end of his days with a lot of suffering requests for euthanasia, in such cases as the applicants are in weak state of mind as well as physical health, that request for euthanasia should be thoroughly investigated to prevent any possibility of crime being committed. Hello, this is Kashif Sima and my ID is 31272. The contribution that I will make and my part in this presentation are the two points. That is loss of confidence in public sec health sector and the role of psychoanalysts and euthanasia. The first point that is loss of confidence in public health sector. Legalization of euthanasia can lead not only to the criminalization of medicine but also to the loss of public confidence in the institute of healthcare. As a matter of fact, physicians and uh, doctors are the healer of our soul. So when they take uh, euthanasia beyond their fundamental role of caring, healing uh, and uh, curing whenever possible, it involves them no matter how compassionate their motive in the inflection of death on those for whom they provide care and treatment. So physicians, nurses and our future medical students who are the healer of our soul need to restore confidence of the general public and their patients also. The second point is the role of psychoanalyst and euthanasia. If a person is fully conscious and makes a decision about euthanasia in order to prevent cases of psychological influence and his decision by others, a thorough conclusion of the psychoanal psychoanalyst about the decision should be conducted. In the case of person who is in a life support, uh, we must rely on whether he left any instruction for this case or not. So, um, it is the job of a psychoanalyst to see the documents and instruction left by the um, person uh, who, is in a, who, who is in a deathbed to see whether he is, he is in a position that he has left any document uh, of his, um, to put him on the, on the medicine of euthanasia or not. Now let's talk about the application of different ethical theories which we have studied with respect to our statement about the ethical dilemma euthanasia. This is Rabia and now I will talk about the controversy regarding the practice of euthanasia. It is essentially a controversy about ethics. The debate about euthanasia is a value debate among people who weigh values differently, who see the nature of the world and the place of human in that world differently. One way of examining values and ethics to see if they are worthwhile is through the use of normative ethical theories. There are several normative ethical theories that have been proposed by the philosophers. I will examine ethical egoism and utilitarianism in order to analyze whether the terminally ill patient has a right to end his life or not. The normative ethical theories of ethical egoism and utilitarianism illustrates the value conflict and the ethical dilemma involved. Egoism may lead one to want to die as the individual may believe that is based on their self-interest and to their personal benefit. It would be better to die. The individual may be experiencing a great deal of pain, loss of bodily functions and faced with spending the remainder of their life as an invalid. So according to ethical egoism, a terminally ill patient has a right to end his life and is considered as an ethical action. Whereas 
a utilitarian perspective may lead a person to choose death. Utilitarians believe that any action could cause the greatest happiness for the greatest number. The pain and financial burdens that family members or society might have to endure could be so great that although the person might want to go on living, it would be in the best interest of the family or of the society that the individual should choose to die. He could also help save vital organs that could be used to save other lives. Patient can die with dignity knowing that they helped to save the lives of others. Since euthanasia will increase happiness and decrease pain at the same time, so it is ethically and morally correct. Virtue Ethics In the case of terminally ill patient, a virtuous person might support the continuation or implementation of treatment to prolong the lives of the patient. However, a question is raised here. Are there any circumstances under which a virtuous agent should decide that euthanasia is preferable to ending someone's life? And the answer should be yes. In some cases, the virtues of mercy and compassion would be deemed most critically and it would be considered virtuous to euthanize a patient in order to relieve them of their suffering because it is a very noble act for someone to take their own life when they are terminally ill and are no longer productive. Ethics of Justice Ethics of Justice deals with the moral choices through a measure of rights of the people involved and chooses the solution that seems to damage the fewest people. So for the patient who are terminally ill, suffering pain, voluntary active euthanasia is ethically justifiable. If a patient is com competent, then autonomy dictates that he should have the right to choose when and how he will die. The principle of justice asserts that it is unjust to deny such patient to end his pain. Theory of Right As the theory of right states that every living being has certain rights, and we have studied rights of one person or the duties of another. So the rights of patient or the duties of the doctor. When they take oath, and the oath is, Above all, I will serve the highest interest of my patients through the practice of my science and my art. The interest of patient room vary from patient to patient and we could state that it's never in their best interest to die. The oath they take clarifies that why doctors should not be allowed to provide active euthanasia to their patients. It is their moral duty to try to save their lives when it is possible and if patient wants to practice his right to end his life, only passive euthanasia should be allowed. I am Halima and I am going to conclude this presentation. It is commonly stated that euthanasia and physician assisted suicide are incompatible with good palliative care. The European Association for Palliative Care has, for instance, communicated the position that euthanasia and physician assisted suicide.